Good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and especially when we're talking about research. Uh, we all know that the epidemic the last century was, uh, I mean, last 10 years back was HIV, and now the epidemic that we are facing is TB. We had a lot of discussion on COVID and TB, and uh, I just wanted to share my experience regarding COVID and TB. Uh, fortunately, during the lockdown, we did keep our TB clinic on, so we did have patients come in. And when I went through the statistics, we actually had more number of patients visiting us during the lockdown than even during the pre-COVID era. So we didn't really face the problem of missed doses of patients not coming to our clinic. What I did notice was the severity of TB was much higher in these patients, even when they were on follow-up. And probably one of the reasons is the mask. Because we all know that when we wear an N95, our oxygen levels do go down. And if you're wearing it for seven to eight hours in a day, we are a little bit hypoxic as compared to not wearing a mask. Was that a reason for causing severity of pulmonary TB? Because most of these patients were compliant to treatment, they were following up, and they landed up with severe TB. So that's one research question which I don't think anybody's been able to answer. And because this is a research forum, I thought I would bring this topic out. The second part was about COVID and TB. And in children, what did we see? Well, most of the children were non-vaccinated. We did see a lot of post-COVID syndrome. So patients with existing TB. And they landed up with uh, worsening hypoxia, or they landed up with fever just not coming under control. And then when we tested them for COVID antibodies, they were positive. These were non-vaccinated children. And they were either MISC or PIMS. So we did see a lot of them. We are in the process of writing up this paper. And they came with different manifestations. Some of them came with worsening of lung symptoms. Some of them came with uh, acute kidney injury. Some of them came with just uh, POTS, that's uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So varied. Uh, presentation. In fact, when we were writing up the Lancet guidelines, this was the point that I brought out in the guideline group. And uh, people were amazed because this is something that they have not noticed. So this is one area, again, that we would like to keep in mind. Now, we've talked a lot about the epidemiology and incidence. Just wanted to highlight a point that we've got uh, this data from WHO, which says that 1.2 million children and young adolescents fell ill with TB in 2021. And over 2 lakh children lost their lives of TB. So it's not a big number as compared to the adult TB, but definitely a significant number. Uh, Mumbai is the epicenter of TB right now in the country. And uh, the kind of TB that we see, whenever we go to the Central TB Division for guidelines and technical advice, they always say that Mumbai is a different spectrum. So the kind of TB that we see in Mumbai is definitely worse. 10% uh, of our TB is drug-resistant TB, even in children. And uh, unfortunately, what I have noticed in the last few months, though we are heading towards TB elimination, and we have a goal of 2025, uh, the number of drug-resistant TB has gone down in the couple of the new cases in these last couple of months, but what's gone up is drug-sensitive TB. And uh, the proportion of TB has remained the same. So the number of new cases that's coming with TB is almost the same. It's just that I'm finding more of drug-sensitive TB going up, and they are very severe forms of TB. Infants getting TB, infants coming with severe hypoxia, uh, and, uh, you know, neuro-TBs. And in children, 60% of TB is extra-pulmonary, as compared to adults where you have predominantly pulmonary TB. So there's a different spectrum that we see. We see more of uh, neuro-TB, we see more of disseminated TB. One thing that I've not highlighted in the talk is the incidence of fibrocavitatory TB, especially in adolescent girls. So when I see an adolescent girl and she comes cachectic, so she'll be weighing around 25 kilo or 20 kilo, she's a 12 year old, 13 year old girl, and I see the x-ray. If I see one-sided fibrocavitatory, I know for sure this is drug sensitive. If I see bilateral fibrocavitatory, I know for sure this is drug resistant. And it's not an observation. We've done a study on this. We don't know the answer why this is occurring, why these adolescent girls are lining up with such severe bad fibrocavitatory TB as compared to the males. 
So the data that we saw that females get less TB as compared to males, is in pediatric, I see more females as compared to males. So that's another uh, area of research that I'm doing now. So we have these uh, various milestones that we've set for ourselves, it looks good, but when we go to what we've achieved, we were supposed to decrease the TB incidence rate by 50%, we've only achieved 10%. Number of deaths we were supposed to reduce by 75%, and we are only down to 5.9%. And cost-wise, we still have 48% having enormous cost towards the treatment. And mind you, though we have the drugs coming free of cost, be it the drug sensitive TB or the drug resistant TB, there are a lot of other comorbidities that need to be taken care of. Say for example, the child with tuberculous meningitis may need a VP shunt. He may need a shunt multiple times. So then these are additional costs that are there. A child may come with hemoptysis. He may need an embolization. So you need an interventional radiologist on board. You may need a lobectomy a surgical uh, procedure. So there are a lot of comorbidities which needs to be still covered. So there are lots of uh, extra costs that are not, you know, recorded into the system. Uh, Treatment-wise, we are achieving almost 50% of our targets. So if we are targeting 40 million, we are achieving 26.3 million. In children, also around 50% we are achieving. So most of the places we are achieving 50% targets of our treatment goals. So. Because this is a meeting on recent advance in research, uh, I'm just going to talk about that aspect. So one aspect that we need to really talk about is the AI tool, the artificial intelligence or the machine learning. And this is coming up in a big way because a uh, lot of companies are coming up with uh, artificial intelligence for diagnosis of TB. In fact, when we started a multicentric trial with ICMR and we have an AI uh, research going on right now in our hospital, there were two other companies who came to me at the same time for the same thing, for the AI thing. So it's everybody's jumping on that bandwagon. Now, there is a shortage of radiologists, but when we talk about uh, you know, cities where we have an N number of radiologists, do we still need an OI AI tool? Yes, because we've had these incidents where uh, radiologists have missed the diagnosis of TB. There was this Lancet study in which they studied various uh, AI tools, various companies, and what WHO has set a target is that you need to have these AI tools having a 90% sensitivity and 70% specificity. So this study looked at various uh, AI's, uh, various companies, and most of them, they found that they were achieving the area under the curve. In fact, uh, there was one which achieved that, and most of them were performing better than the radiologist. So these AIs will be replacing or maybe going hand in hand with our TB diagnosis in a big way in the future. But we are far, far, far away because we hardly have anything for the pediatric population. So this is some area that is going to be in the pipeline. It's the coming future. And we need to have these AI tools being tested in the pediatric population. Now we talk about the IGRAS. So we have the tuberculin skin test and we have the Ponferron TB goal. Uh, how reliable are these? We all know that Mantu test is a hypersensitivity reaction. The problem is that you don't, you cannot predict active disease with this. It's more only for latent TB. But Mantu test can also be false positive with your BCG vaccine. So if you have a child who's received BCG and you give a Mantu test, you are going to get it positive. You will also get a Mantu test positive with the <coughs> environmental mycobacteria, that's your non tuberculous mycobacteria. So how do you interpret a positive Mantu test? You have these IGRAs which are very specific. So you have a purified protein derivative weighted as an antigen for your Mantu test, whereas for your IGRAs you have the ESAT 7 and the CFP 10. Now, uh, what we did is we did this study in 2013, some time back, and we compared. It was a small uh, set of patients. Uh, can we go back to the slide? Can we go back? Okay. So we did this study in 33 uh, children, and all of them we tested with Mandu and a Ponferron TB goal. What is important is out of 11 patients who had a Mantu positive, 11 were negative. So even though we say that the agreement is 63% of Kappa is 0 
it tells us how we interpret this report. Is QFT not performing well, or is uh, TSC positive, which is false positive? We followed up these children, and we found that none of them developed the disease. So most likely, these TSCs were false positive, most likely due to BCG or the environmental mycobacteria. So when we're going to talk about latent TB and rolling out latent TB program for TB elimination, we'll have to be very specific in the rollout, whether we are going to use MONDU or we are going to use quantiferon TB gold. Now, when we did this study, at that time, the quantiferon TB gold <coughs> Uh, was not very reliable for children less than four years. Now you have these new versions that have come, that have gone down to even younger children where you can use these tests. Again, we are doing a study with NIRH on uh, use of quantiferon TB gold plus and uh, screening of slum children and looking for latent TB in them. So the data, we are just analyzing our data. So once it comes out, I will share it with you all. So, this was the conclusion of our study that, you know, it can be used for ruling out false positives. So, right now if somebody asks me, are we going to do a MANDU or TST, I would say both. We would need to do both, TST and Ingra. Now we have the expert ultra which has come out. And uh, WHO has given a guideline that you could use it for initial diagnosis on sputum, on mesopharyngeal aspirate, on gastric aspirate or stool. So that's wonderful because we get away with gastric lavage. In children, we don't get sputum. So we need to do a gastric lavage or we need to do a bulb that is a bronchoalveolar lavage. So that's very invasive. So if we can get away with just a stool test, that's very, very interesting for us. However, there's no data in Indian children. So we have all the data coming out from Africa and Bangladesh. And this was the Bangladesh study. And it said that ultra sensitivity was uh, 58.6% with specificity of 88.1, which is pretty good. And whereas the plain expert, not the ultra, had a uh, sensitivity of 37.9. But there were a lot of patients who had these trace codes. That means you had this ultra giving you a positive result, which is a low positive. And when you test it on, and then it doesn't tell you refer resistance or sensitive, because it's too low to tell you refer sensitive positive. So we have these indeterminate ultras, and a lot of them do come indeterminate. So how do we interpret these patients? Do we start them on drug-sensitive TB treatment, or do we start them on drug-resistant uh, TB treatment? So very difficult to make that out. So again, this is an area for research that we really need to go and look into. Cochrane analysis looked at nasopharyngeal aspirate and all the various specimens and what did it find that nasopharyngeal aspirate had the lowest sensitivity. So though WHO has come out with a guideline saying that we should be using nasopharyngeal aspirate, I think we need to look at everything in the Indian scenario, whether it's feasible for us, whether are we going to uh, get the same results. So we, though we are in the era of uh, evidence-based medicine, we still have to look whether it's uh, applicable to our setup. Now we come to uh, pediatric DRTB treatment and the recent advance is the four-month regimen. I think a lot of speakers have spoken about this four-month regimen. And uh, in pediatric TB, it's still the same combination of drugs that we use for six months and it's only that it's been uh, brought down to four months by the SHINE trial. This also included centers from India. Now this Recommendation has come for patients with uh, non-severe TB. So we are talking about lymph node TB or pleural effusion. You know, the non-severe kinds of TB. So primary complex. But if you look at, if we say it's lymph node TB and it's going to be uh, four months therapy, a lot of children have only isolated mediastinal lymph node TB. They don't have pulmonary. So it's only isolated mediastinal lymph node TB. And when we looked at our study, our data on how long do we treat these mediastinal lymph nodes. Now, mediastinal lymph nodes, you can't keep on doing biopsies to look for end of treatment. So the only way to look is look at the radiological resolution. So one way is either the nodes disappear or the nodes calcify. So that's the way we pick up whether the tra uh, disease has come under control. And if you look at that, most of the patients require treatment for a year. So if you're going to say that it's going to be four months, therapy for lymph node TB, we have to be very careful. Paradoxical reactions. A lot of children get paradoxical reaction. Paradoxical reaction is like an immune reactivation. 
So there's worsening of TB symptoms, but in a way because of the immune system. It's not because the disease is uh, flaring up, it's because of the immunity. So you need to give steroids at that time to suppress the immunity, just like you have iris in HIV. Now again, we looked at 1,000 children retrospectively done. 33 came with paradoxical reactions. Most of them had lymph nodes, tuberculomas, and some of them developed pleural effusions. So these are again non-severe TBs who landed up with paradoxical reactions and they needed treatment for longer, sometimes even up to two years. So if we are going to put this into a guideline of four months therapy, you need to have a strong follow-up backup. You need to have medical officers who are trained to pick up all these situations. And you just can't be stopping treatment at four months, otherwise we are going to land up in a lot of trouble. TBM again, uh, for pediatric TBM, that's neuro TB, new guidelines have come up saying that you could go from 12 month regimen to a six month regimen that contains INH, rifampicin, pyrazinamide and ethionamide. This is based on South African data. We don't have any experience of ethionamide in neuro TB in Indian population. We know it's an excellent drug for CNS, it penetrates the CNS very well, but we really have no data on ethionamide. So again, what would be the ideal regimen? Somebody needs to do a randomized control trial to come out with the uh, neuro TB, what the recommendation should be. And just the uh, one paper that we had uh, sent to the International Journal of uh, Tuberculosis and Lung Disease about tuberculomas. We know that tuberculomas are pretty common in CNSCB. And how do we decide end of therapy? What is our criteria to say this is end of therapy? Again, our criteria is the same that it's either it's calcified or it's resolved. There is no active tuberculoma, so no perilesional edema or all those things. And we found in our study that patients who had no radiological recovery at the end of 12 months needed treatment for almost 20 months. <coughs> Whereas some of them who had radiologicals needed a little bit longer. So again, this is an area nobody knows for sure how long to give treatment in tuberculoma. There are no biomarkers which tells us, oh, this is the end of uh, TB, now we can stop treatment. So probably we need to develop biomarkers for this. Uh, latent TB is going up in a big way. We are all into jumping into it about treating. We've got various regimens, either we give six months of INH, which is right now in the program. We give three months therapy of weekly pentin uh, with isoniazide, or we give a three month regimen of INH and rifampicin. Now which one is better? We don't know. Again, we need to find out which works for India. If I'm going to use INH and rifampicin for three months, I'm push, am I pushing the patient towards drug-resistant TB? I don't know. So we need data on that. Now let's talk about drug doses. A uh, lot of pharmacokinetic studies are going on, and uh, we've been talking about a lot of data. Beraquil and Delaminate we've been using in children, and we've been using the doses as per mathematical modeling. We really don't know what the ideal dose is. Just the recommendation that came out for INH. We earlier used to use INH at 5 mg per kg, and then the recommendation now is 10 mg per kg. Rifampicin we used to use at 10 mg per kg, and now the recommendation is 15. Uh, is it feasible? Uh, the only thing that we did we looked at various Indian data previously <coughs> who had done these 5 and 10 and most of them found that 5 mg per kg seems to be adequate for treatment of TB. It also depends upon who is a faster, who uh, acetylizes the drug faster and slower and most of Indian children seem to be slow whereas most of the African children seem to be fast. So they need to have a higher dose whereas Indian children seem to need a lower dose. So again, uh, how do we decide? And are we giving, uh, causing more hepatotoxicity by giving a higher dose? We don't know that data. So we did this uh, study. There were a lot of studies on 10 milligram per kg, and most of these, they found that uh, they were giving higher doses, uh, were above the therapeutic range at six hours. If they were giving 10 milligram per kg. And this was our study, which we did at 10 milligram per kg, and we took uh, various samples at uh, to get the area under the curve, zero hours, one hour, two hour, three hour, six hours, twenty four hours, and we did it by LCMS. And we found that the CMAX was 8.3, reached in 1.2, so we were definitely giving higher, higher doses. Yeah, I got five minutes. And uh, so most of our children seem to have a higher levels of INH. None of them got hepatotoxicity. But we need to actually do this with a genotype study. 
to actually know what's the problem in these patients and find out the right dosing. Now, if you look at rifampicin, if you look at CNSTB, there are a lot of trials now going on about CNSTB and rifampicin being 20 milligram per kg. So what would be the ideal? We lo use a lot of rifampicin in uh, staph aureus infections. And in those patients, we use 20 milligram per kg. Linozolid, we say that in adults, we use 600 milligram. In children, we use 10 milligram per kg. When I'm using 10 milligram per kg in a 40 kilo child, most of them land up with peripheral neuropathy. And it's severe debilitating. I go down to 300, that's half the dose. It's arbitrary. I don't know how it works, whether it's working or not. But the moment I'm on 600 milligram, it's a danger point for me. I cannot finish the therapy with 600. I have to come down to 300. I'm, am I underdosing them? I don't know. So other unanswered questions in TB. A lot of times I see TB coming as malignancy. So this is a patient who was uh, in, in the cancer institute, Tata Cancer Institute. He came to them with a white eye. So they thought it's retinoblastoma. And they enucleated the eye. And when they sent it for histopath, it was TB. So you have these patients coming as tumor. Look at this white eye, the complete tumor level. You have the scapular lesions, which were again TB. So we need answers. Why does TB behave like this? We need answers. Why do some children get recurrent TB? There are some of them lined up with recurrent TB, two or three episodes. We know MSMD, there is Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial diseases, is one of the issues. There is something wrong with the immunity. We've done studies uh, to look at vitamin D receptors in TB and how vitamin D helps in TB. But we need more data on all of this than these treatment variations in tuberculosis. Now, you look at this child. February 2012, there's a tuberculosis sitting there. 2013, tuberculosis increased. November 2015, the tuberculosis still there. How do I decide when is the end point? How do I know when do I stop the therapy? And this is very, very common. These kind of TBs, tuberculomas, mediastinal TB, very common and how, when to stop treatment is the concern. So the list could go on. There are a lot of observations in clinical practice where we don't have answers and research comes into the uh, area there. It has to be a collaborative effort. I always tell my students and uh, researchers that research is not meant for promotions, it's not meant for your CV, it's not meant for funding. It is something that can be translated into clinical practice. So if you're going to give me laboratory research, which I can't put into clinical practice, that research has no meaning for me. It is something that has to have a benefit in the clinical practice. So a lot of scientists are sitting in this audience. So I would like you all to please think about it, the questions that I have raised in clinical practice and how your research could help us, how we could go into a collaborative mode for that. So something that puts, that can be put into practice. So I'm going to end before time, and I think it's a Eureka moment for all of us. So if you all have been brainstorming, and we have a tea break coming up, so we can share ideas, and uh, hopefully we can come up with something which helps the people. Thank you very much.